Are we now on? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the, um, the launch of this season to um, tonight's public hearing. Um, the time is now 7.02. And seeing as a quorum of committee members is in attendance, actually everybody, this public hearing is being called to order. So welcome everybody to the August 31st, 2022 public hearing of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature on July 16th of 2022, this meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. And I'm now going to take a roll call and then we'll go over what this, um, what the evening is going to look like in terms of the agenda. Um, so why don't we also, sort of doing this roll call, use this as an opportunity for people to introduce themselves. Um, so I will start, my name is Becky Michaels. I've been on the committee for, um, I think about two years. This is, I'm going into my second cycle and I've taken over the big shoes of Gail Lansky to chair the committee. Um, and I'm thrilled to be doing it. This is my first meeting that I'm chairing. So be patient with me. Um, and I will just move along on the top of my screen if people can just do the same. Um, I will turn to you, Lucas. And you're on mute. Hi, my name is Lucas Hanscom. I have also been on the committee for about two years, and this is my second cycle as well. Um, Suzanne? Hi, Suzanne Schilling. I have um, been on the committee since May, so this is my first cycle. Great. And Greg? Yes, um, I'm Greg Bascom. This is also my first cycle, uh, <clears throat> and I'm looking forward to this coming year. Matt? Yes, I'm Matt Larson, and I've always been thinking of myself as a newer member, but now as I look around, I realize I'm the longest tenured person on the committee. <laughs> so I've been around a few cycles, um, but um, glad to be here. Great. And Rika? I'm Rika Clement, and um, I think I've been on the committee for a couple of years, maybe three, but I've never been on it. Uh, I was not on it prior to COVID. So I've never done anything but virtual meetings with the group. Great. And Ben, do you want to introduce yourself and explain your role? Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Breger. I'm a planner for the town and the, the staff liaison to the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Great. Um, so tonight, the um, I, I welcome everybody who's in the, all the attendees who we, we can't see on screen yet. Um, one of the exciting things that we are hoping is going to work tonight is that we have figured out how to have um, the speakers during the, the hearing portion actually um, come into the room and join us and be able to see their faces while they're talking to us. Um, so Ben is going to be working on that um, tricky Zoom technology while we're, we're going, and, and hopefully that will be a, a great um, sort of slight modification, um, but it'll be great to see people's faces. Obviously, if people who are speaking don't want to be seen, that's absolutely your your choice but it is an option um, for tonight so just you know um, have your your video on if, if you want um, we are going to um, start off the meeting with um, the public hearing where we'll um, look forward to hearing people's comments um, about the community priorities for the 2022 and 2023 application process um, the areas that we are looking forward to hearing from you on include um, social services, non-social services, such as housing and the public infrastructure, um, target areas, sort of which areas we should be targeting as a committee um, where non-social services can take place. And then finally, um, reviewing our community development strategy, which um, is a, and Ben, correct me if I'm describing this incorrectly, but it is a, um, a document that um, every couple of years, every few years, um, we're required to create and, and turn in, I think with our, um, with the applications that um, is a um, pretty in-depth um, statement of the, the what our priorities are um, and the kinds of things that we have funded in the past um, and, um, I guess, broken out by um, by all of the, the different kinds of priorities that we'll be looking at. Is that about right, Ben? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so how we're going to structure tonight is that um, during the public hearing, we're going to give um, every 
organization, anybody who's here representing an organization will give every organization a five minute period to speak. If you're here on behalf um, of just yourself and just to, to speak, you also have five minutes. Um, so I would ask for anybody who is here um, who's planning to speak about an organization in particular, if you can just identify when you first come on, who else will be speaking? And that way Ben can ensure to bring in those people also so we can do each organization um, at once. And if you have any questions about that, raise your hand and we can um, we can go and answer those um, as we move along. So with that, I will um, open the public hearing. Mm -hmm. and and actually, Becky, I see that uh, it looks like Hilda Greenbaum has a question. Yes, yeah. yeah, hello, Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague. You wrote, and I read the article in the newspaper and called a couple of people up here in North Amherst, but I don't know if anybody else is on. Um, I noticed on the website and then the, I guess mostly on the website that you're only targeting downtown and one other place was at East Amherst, I don't remember. But anyway, I, I did want to ask the question of why is North Amherst never on this list for CDBG money because, first of all, we're our gateway into the town, which looks pretty disgusting at this point. We need beautification terribly. And I would like to find out if it's possible for us to, to get money for something like a mini park up here that might screen the Potter's Garage from the new library that's going in, and maybe a, a little mini pocket park or some shade trees up here in North Amherst. Is that something that's on your possibilities on, on the, the ground? It is public infrastructure in a way, but, but I mean, North Amherst desperately as a gateway to the town desperately needs help. And I've, I'm, I'm working on that. Great, so, well, so Hilda, what I hear you, you both asking a question and also advocating for North Amherst to be one of the target areas. Um, so well, I don't know whether that's possible. That's why I'm asking yeah. a question because I didn't know whether you were locked into what was on the map on the website or, or whether there's a way for North Amherst to participate in the program because we've never, never been part of it in all the many years that I was on town meeting. It's always gone sidewalks to Fort River or something on the other end of town. And so we, it, is possible. Huh? it is possible. Um, and North Amherst is certainly an area that we can look at for target areas. Ben, do you want to explain maybe how it is that we end up giving money that it's that we don't get to choose the projects we or that are created, but the projects come to us? Yeah, exactly. So the, the advisory committee um, only reviews projects that are proposed as a um, and uh, whereas they're not the ones proposing the projects uh, in particular. So um, the advisory committee, committee does, you know, make recommendations um, of projects that come in and also makes recommendations on the target areas. Um, so those, are, those can be changed uh, year to year. So right now it's um, the said downtown uh, East Amherst and Pomeroy Village Center. I do believe North Amherst has been a target area in years past. Um, Not that uh, I, anyway. Yeah, but certainly, um, yeah, I appreciate the comment. And I think once we get to that uh, discussion, uh, top kind of thing. Kind of well, who decides that. if you don't decide? Who, do, who hands out the money? So we decide which the what are the target areas, but we don't get to decide who's going to apply to us for money. So if nobody, if the town doesn't come to us with a proposal for, for example, putting sidewalks in a North Amherst, we can't give money to a project like that. The project has to exist and, and okay. or be a project that somebody, in, that, that the town is planning to do, and then they come to us. So we, we can't just create the project. And no, but, money for it. but I mean, if we're not in a target area yet, or how do we, just, how do we find out if, if North Amherst can be a target area and whether we should talk to Ben about applying. Um, yeah, well, it, it, North Amherst can definitely be a target area. I think that just, it's part of a broader discussion of, you know, uh, using the resources wisely and, and targeting the areas most in need. And I think there's, yeah, definitely a strong case to be made for North Amherst. Um, 
And I would, you know, I would encourage you to email um, whether it's DPW or to other town staff to advocate for, um, you know, proposing funding sidewalk or park projects in, in North Amherst. And then, you know, if there's strong enough demand for those, then we can, you know, then we can kind of then add North Amherst as a target area, seeing that there's been. Well, something like a mini park appropriate? Um, yeah, there's so yeah, there's there's you know certain stipulations in terms of you know being in a census block of majority low moderate income and you know serving uh, local residents as opposed to like more like a regional park. But if it's a small pocket park that's you know designed for residents in a uh, appropriate census block, then yes, I think something like that would be um, eligible. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. With that, I think I may hang up. Okay, okay thank thanks for joining. And uh, and you just automatically bring in the next person? Sure, so um, I think we're inviting public comment now about uh, social service projects. Um, so I'm going to bring in Judy Roberts here. Hi. Um, Hi. Glad to be here. And I want to thank the town for the funding that we have. We receive funding for this year that we're currently in. And we're very grateful. Um, we will be running um, three levels of classes. And um, so um, we are basic literacy project. I'm the executive director, Judith Roberts, and the literacy project is an adult education program that helps folks to get their high school equivalency degree. And um, used to be called the GED. Um, now the test in Massachusetts we use is called the high set high school equivalency test. And the literacy project recognizes that the high school equivalency diploma is just a stepping stone and that folks really need to go on to community college, job training programs and better jobs. So in addition to our um, two levels of classes. We have one level that goes um, all the way from a um, grade level equivalency of like a first or second grade reading um, through eighth grade. And then we have, um, that's broken into two sections, um, first through fifth and then fifth through eighth. And then we have high school level um, ninth through 12th grade equivalency. And we have also, in addition, a college readiness class. So in Amherst, we have a very vibrant program and um, students go on from the college res uh, readiness class to Holyoke Community College, Greenfield Community College, um, one of the five colleges potentially in our region. And what we're really focusing on is um, we're an education program, but it's for adults and we're focusing on economic sustainability. So we, we know that people without a high school diploma are not gonna be able to earn a family supporting wage. And so we welcome adults in, to come into our program and move on obviously to higher education and better jobs. Um, I requested one of our students attend tonight and speak on behalf, but I can't see if she's here or not. Shirley Batances, did Shirley Batances attend? Yes. Becky, you're nodding. Yes, I see okay. her name. Great, so Shirley um, is one of our graduates who's now attending Greenfield Community College and she was uh, going to read a short statement. Hi everyone. Hi Shirley, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm a current graduate of the Liter Literacy Project. 
My name is Shirley Botances. I hail from Brooklyn, New York. I came to Massachusetts in 1994 and I have been here since. I have been working as a CNA until 2015. When I got hurt, this is when I got hurt. Fortunately or unfortunately, it gave me an opportunity an opportunity to seek my high set. I am happy it worked out. Now a graduate of 2021 of the literary project of Amherst. And in 2022, we had finally gotten a graduation because of the pandemic. During that time, I had enrolled in Greenfield Community College. I now passed my first semester and am now a junior studying business management. Much thanks and appreciation to the Literacy Project of Amherst for never giving up on me. Not only did they give me a chance, they encouraged to further my education and my future goals. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks, Shirley. Shirley is also an Amherst resident. So I thought yes. I, I, I didn't say that, but that's an important um, yes. part of our program. So thank you. And does anyone have questions for me? Anyone? I don't know where we're at on time. You're perfect. You have 14 seconds. <laughs> oh, perfect. OK, well, thank you again. And thank you, thank you to Shirley for coming. Take care. You're yeah. welcome. And Ben, it looks like um, David Ross is, has a hand up. I don't know if that's to ask a question or to speak, but we have. Great, yeah, I'll bring Mr. Ross in here. Mute. All right, I, I see my name. Can you hear me as well? We can. We can hear you. Okay. Oh, there I am. All right. Well, I uh, I had the pleasure of being on Taylor Street today, and I was so excited to see the work has begun that you helped pay for to replace the sidewalks on that street. So my very brief comment today is, you've started a project that I hope you complete. If you extend the Taylor Street sidewalk to High Street, and they've already put in the curb cut on High Street sidewalk, um, then the people in that neighborhood, and it's a very diverse neighborhood, will be able to walk on that sidewalk on High Street to Taylor Street and make use of both. And then when they get to Kellogg Street, if we make a sidewalk on the hill, they'll be able to get to town safely. Um, I have to tell you, my wife and I have been walking in the street on High Street because the sidewalk is so dangerous. She actually broke her ankle because it got caught in one of the uh, sewer grates. Um, so it's a very dangerous situation and um, the tree roots have really made a, a mess of it and it needs uh, some repair. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll target the area again by completing the project, which will make a safe route from that neighborhood all the way into town. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you again for doing Taylor Street. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Mr. Ross, I actually don't believe um, that funding for uh, Taylor Street came from uh, block grant funds. I think that came from just the general uh, town sidewalk funds. I might be mistaken, but I don't recall. Um, I would know better than I, but I thought yeah. it had to this committee before. Were, uh, Either the, way, the, yeah. It was the well, town. It's related, it's related, related because the, the yeah. block grant committee did uh, fund uh, a new sidewalk on Kellogg Ave last year, and that that's going to be under construction probably this fall. So I mean, there's a case to be made for tying it all in and going to. I think my concern about and, Kellogg is that I believe it's in front of the Ann Whalen Apartments that you're right. doing the work, but yeah. when you go to the hill, there's a sidewalk that drops off precipitously to the street, and then no sidewalk on the hill itself leading right. down to the apartments. Correct, yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that That's a very dangerous situation in that particular area because of the hill and the curve. Absolutely. Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks, Judge Russ.
All right. Um, next up, I'm going to bring in uh, to you the first time I see his friend, Steven Rodriguez. Hi, Francine. Oh, you're on mute. I was like, I know you can see me, but you can't hear me now. <laughs> Thank you. I was having an issue. We've been logging on today for some weird reason, but I'm here. So thank you for having me. Um, and uh, we were funded. I want to thank, of course, the committee for funding us um, for a couple of years now on a housing um, housing retention and housing advocacy program. We have a community housing support program. And Fred, can you um, just tell us what organization you're from just for new people? Sure. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm from the uh, Center for Human Development. It's Family Outreach of Amherst, um, which is a small division of CHD. CHD is a pretty large organization, but we're just a small um, division here in Amherst that works with low income families and children. And so the program that we uh, have been funded for and hoping to get funded for again is um, in regards to housing for people in Amherst. Um, I know everyone is aware that, you know, there's a major crisis in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I saw a fact that kind of let, stayed with me that I wanted to share with the committee, which is um, there was a national housing coalition came out with a fact of the week um, that in the state of Massachusetts, in order to afford a two-bedroom apartment and spend the recommended 30% of income on shelter, uh, a full-time worker must earn $37.97 per hour. Now, we know that's really unrealistic. Um, the annual household income needed to afford a two-bedroom rental at HUD's fair market rent is $78,984. Um, I don't know a lot of people that make that much money, especially families that we work with, even individuals and seniors that we're seeing. Um, and that's just in the state altogether. Amherst rentals are exceeding HUD's fair market rental rates. I mean, I'd say they're tripling probably HUD's fair market rental rate. Um, I've been inundated with folks calling to apply for the new resident assistance program. Um, that the town has created with ARPA funding to help folks with rental arrears. And I had no idea the amount of people, because, you know, we have our clientele and we work with the majority of low-income families, but this is open to everyone in town. And the, the amount of calls that are coming in is extreme. I mean, if all people are soft struggling with rents right now. We're talking seniors, you know, singles, families. And so the need is extremely high. Um, and, and people are feeling like they're getting pushed out of Amherst, unfortunately, because the rental rates are so high. I mean, I've even talked to students who say they can't afford the rents in Amherst off campus. So, I mean, it clearly is a major issue that we're facing. And, you know, the families feel like they have to make a choice to leave Amherst because they can't afford the rents. Um, and even if they're doubled or tripled up there, it's just too much. Um, my other concern, you know, just showing how the need is so high in Amherst is, you know, some families, not everybody works for Family Outreach of Amherst, clearly. And so last week, there was a family who the sheriff came and posted a eviction notice on their door. They had to be out by Friday. Um, luckily, a, a neighbor of theirs that does know about Family Outreach of Amherst connected them to us. So we were immediately able to, you know, advocate for them and tell them what they needed to do to stop this eviction. So they had to, you know, get to Springfield that day to ask for a new court date to stop this eviction. So now we're working with them, you know, to apply for raft funds and also um, unemployment for the dad who got sick and lost his job and also help him find new employment eventually. But that's just one family that if some community person hadn't connected them to us, they would have been homeless. It's a mom and dad with three children who are non-English speaking. So they didn't even understand the notices they were getting. They knew they were behind in rent, but they didn't understand the severity of what, what it was leading to. Um, so I'm grateful for this community person that did connect them to us. Um, seeing a lot of seniors as well, really struggling. 
Um, I've met with two seniors so far for this program and, um, you know, they have mortgages and they're just not able to even keep up with the mortgages. Um, a lot of folks are struggling just, of course, with the economy. You know, uh, food prices are up, gas prices are up, um, and people are just not being able to make ends meet. Um, even folks that we've helped catch up are still really struggling to sustain, which I'm very concerned about. Um, you know, because if you don't have a subsidy in Amherst, it's really difficult to, to, to live in Amherst. Um, even two parent working households. I mean, you just don't make enough money to pay the rents that, that are being asked for folks in Amherst. About um, so, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. So I just wanna say that I, you know, I feel that this is a, a program that is really, really needed in Amherst. And I think we're being highly affected by um, you know, retaining rents and helping people catch up with rental arrears and getting them the resources they need to be able to stay in town and stay housed. So thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Francine? Okay, great. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. For your work. Thanks. All right, next up I'll bring you in the uh, next thing that is Lori Newman. Hi, everyone. And um, this is exciting. It looks like I've promoted to a panelist, it looks like. So <laughs> that feels really, uh, that feels really like, uh, like being in the big time. So let me just see <laughs> if I can turn my video on. So um, thanks for, um, for welcoming us. And um, we were Center for New Americans, which I'm the director of, was not funded this year. We have been funded in the past. Um, so I was looking at the website to see if I could um, just get a sense of where the committee is headed. And, um, you know, I really appreciated seeing that it looks like the strategy is to find a balanced approach to all of the needs. Um, that's what's, you know, on the CDBG website. And I was also reading what the purpose of the community development block grants are as authorized by Congress. And so one of the things that it says is to develop viable urban communities by providing decent housing, suitable living environment, and expanding economic opportunities. So I feel like the expanding economic opportunities is what we work on, like what um, Judith Roberts was referring to with the literacy project. So, you know, given that one of the social service priorities is economic self-sufficiency, that's the, the um, template that we fit into. So at Center for New Americans, we offer free classes in English for speakers of other languages. Um, and we feel that these services are really relevant in Amherst, given that 26% of the public school children this past year have come from families where English is not the first language. And that's a lot higher than the state percentage, which is about 20%. So clearly Amherst has achieved its goal of being a diverse community. And given another goal of honoring DEI objectives, which means providing access, a program like ours, I think, which, which um, provides free English instruction for the parents of all of these children, is what unlocks the door for them and gives them access. So in addition to teaching English, we offer childcare for the very young children of our students. We connect people to community resources like Family Outreach of Amherst, like the Survival Center. And then we help place people in jobs like at Amherst College and UMass Amherst and the Center for Extended Care where our graduates go. And, and we also refer people to Greenfield Community College. So we feel like we are a pathway to economic self-sufficiency and given those broad goals that you have, we hope that you will consider us as a possible grantee in future years. And I can answer any questions if you have them. Does anybody have any questions for Lori? Lori, can I had one question. The, the statistic you just gave that 26% of public school children are from families where English is not the first language. Is that um, 
I know you said that's high for in the state. Is that higher than it has been in the past for Amherst? Do you yes. Know yes. I mean, Amherst has always been. Yes. I mean, Amherst in the master plan, the original master plan, Amherst prioritized diversity and said that it wanted to be a diverse community and acknowledged that to be successful at that, they had to provide social services to support that. That's actually spelled out. And so I think Amherst has opened its doors. And yes, it's higher than Northampton and the surrounding communities. I think it's an intentional approach. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. All right, the next hand I see is uh, Susan from Big Brothers Big Sisters. So I'll uh, promote Susan to a panelist. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hi, Susan. Hi. Well, great to see you all. And, um, and my name is Susan Nicastro, and I'm the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. And I just wanted to just share how grateful we are for the continuing support that we've received from this funding. And just to emphasize that mentoring is more important than ever now. We have a growing li waiting list of children um, looking for mentors and, you know, we are very well aware of the positive impact that mentoring has on children, um, children on positive youth development being, you know, the, the focus of what we do through quali providing high quality one to one mentoring relationships and most of the children that we serve are Amherst children and most of the children we serve are some of the most vulnerable children in Amherst in terms of income level and challenges that children's families are facing. Um, so, and we've been providing mentoring here in Hampshire County for over 47 years. And the, the funding and support that has been provided through, for us has just been extremely critical to us being able to continue to, to provide the service that we do. And yeah, I would just hope that the committee will consider continuing to support our efforts to, to provide high quality mentoring to children in Amherst. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that anyone has. And again, just can't say enough how grateful we are for the continued support that we've received and for all of your efforts that you know, make this support possible and you know, make our work continue to thrive. And um, so we're looking forward to, to continuing to do what we do. And we, we couldn't do it without, this, without funders who provide the support that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Thanks for coming. Does yeah. anyone have any questions for Susan? Great. All right. Thanks, Susan. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Appreciate it. You too. Thank you, um, great. The next hand I see is Lev and Andrew. Hi, Lev. Sorry, it's really embarrassing when at this point you forget to turn off your mute. Um, thanks so much for having me and um, really appreciate uh, all the folks uh, for your participation in this UDBG process. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to actually just ask a clarifying question before I start. Um, is the intent of our remarks today supposed to be more around the larger issues of priorities or the specific projects that we anticipate and organizations that we anticipate applying for? Priorities, I think. Okay, right. Okay, thank you. That yeah. was, yes, forgive me. I just uh, wanted to speak to that, but I w wanted to make sure if I needed to also speak to the specifics of our project that I did. Um, so, as I shared when we met several months ago, um, that when I think about priorities, it's really coming from my vantage point of working with roughly 7,000 people annually at the Amherst Survival Center. And 
from that, I think that the priorities that come through just incredibly clear is the emphasis around foundational basic needs supports across our, our region. Um, so I feel very strongly about uh, temporary housing and shelter and supports for people experiencing homelessness. I think we also really see tremendous need for case management, family support, working alongside individuals and families to access resources, to set goals, to navigate challenges. Um, I see a lot of really critical need there specifically for support and staying in housing. I think that's one of the pieces that Francine was talking about that um, we need to make sure that people who are currently housed are able to stay so and in safe and solid living conditions. Um, I think there are also some pieces there that are really connected to some of the components that Lori was speaking to in terms of the ways that Center for New Americans, for example, wraps around their students, they're providing education, but all those other links in. Um, and not surprisingly, I also want to voice my really strong opinion that food and nutrition absolutely needs to be a top priority um, for the upcoming CDBG application process. And I think it's possible for the committee to really approach all of these priorities with a focus on accessibility, equity, um, and really making sure that there's that emphasis on quality and measurable impact throughout, throughout the projects. Um, when the committee met a few months ago, my understanding was that you had conducted a survey about priorities to supplement or um, further guide me on these hearings. And um, I was excited to hear about that effort to gather broader input, um, but was concerned when I learned, or at least my understanding was that the survey had received a pretty limited response and almost entirely from one distribution source. And so while well, of course those responses are, um, are valid and valuable and important to consider, um, it didn't seem like they represented a breadth of issues. Um, and I think seeing that things like food and nutrition and housing and those types of resources that I just mentioned as really top critical priorities weren't represented in the top was just indicative to me that there was a large population of this community that hadn't been reached um, by that survey. So I just wanna really think about sort of who that ended up being representative of or not. Um, and the, the piece that I wanna share specifically about food insecurity at this time is that actually, um, I think that there was almost a little bit of a comment in jest when we knew we had to do the second public hearing of, okay, well, we'll see. And it's been several months and we'll talk about if the, pro if the priorities have changed, but there tends to be a lot of continuity in the things that are going on even from year to year, much less a couple of months, um, months past. But in this situation, I can say from my vantage point that actually the priority around food and nutrition has shifted. The situation has gotten much more dire. Um, the last five months have each been record breaking in the number of people that we're seeing at the Emmer Survival Center. Um, we are certainly not the only organization that is serving people experiencing food insecurity and um, and that is a, an experience across the board around the region. Um, but we are currently, every single one of these months has exceeded our highest pandemic surges. We're seeing a 20% increase in our, in our food pantry just versus earlier this year, which was already busier than all of last year, et cetera. Um, we had uh, a more than 30% increase in the number of people coming every day for produce and bread um, and really exceeding that we'd had at any time throughout the pandemic um, and similar trends with people coming for meals. And, um, and that's a combination of, it certainly includes people who have utilized services like the MR Survival Center for a period of time um, and are coming more frequently. But the big change right now is that we are seeing lots of new faces every day. About um, 30 more seconds, Lev, sorry. Great. So um, I just want to really emphasize this component of these basic needs priorities um, that uh, we're really at a, I think, at an inflection point. And unfortunately, what I'm hearing from other folks in the field around is we're expecting this trend to continue for a significant period of time, which we think makes it um, that much more 
important to consider this as a critical need for this two year cycle upcoming because I think we're looking at a really critical couple of years in our community. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming. Does anybody have any questions for Lev? Yeah, Matt. Lev, thanks for your message. I was um, kind of surprised to learn that that the numbers are even greater than they were at the peak of the pandemic. Um, do you have any sense of you know what is causing that? Is it is the inflation a part of it or are there other other factors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I our my understanding is that inflation is absolutely the driving force. Um, and I think the way that I frame that is I think most of us can experience having some sticker shock at the grocery store um, or feeling this sense of, oh goodness, okay, I'm making different choices of I can't get this or I can do this. And for any family for whom they were already struggling to make ends meet or that already wasn't enough, these prices on the all of the most basic essentials, right? We're seeing it on utilities, we're seeing it on gas, we're seeing it on, you know, at the grocery store um, have been just paralyzing, debilitating, like, you know, you know, I don't know, really incredibly detrimental. There is also a level, I think, of kind of a snowball. Um, so it's been quite a while, I mean, eight months now since the end of the um, child tax credit. Um, but certainly that was something that uh, had enormous economic impact. Um, we've also are definitely aware of more people where essentially the bans on evictions kind of coming off over time or getting far enough out even once they were no longer included in whatever category but it taking however long for sort of landlords to catch up so I think we're just seeing this snowballing um snowballing effect but it definitely is uh, is a really it's a significant uptick thank you for coming and, and giving all that information Really helpful. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for your work. Thanks. Yeah, um, at this point uh, in the agenda, we are still focused on uh, any social services that would like to speak. So if there's any other social service agencies that, uh, or anyone who would like to speak on behalf of the social services, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, we can move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, to hear comments about non-social services. All right, so I'll bring in um, Sarah Sargent, uh, I believe has comments about the non-social services. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm hey, Sarah Sargent, I'm with Valley Community Development. Um, thank you for all the work that you do. And then I know I'm not in social services, um, but I just wanna say thanks to all the uh, social service agencies because our clients too see the, um, we see the impact that all of you have had. Um, as the Small Business Program Manager for Valley, um, we continue to focus a lot on the economic development that's happening across the region, but specifically in Amherst. Um, since January of 2022, through the end of July, over 70 businesses registered with the, or with the town of Amherst, which is great. Um, we primarily focus on working with those in the low to moderate income or underserved populations. Um, we are continuing to see an uptick in people starting um, sole proprietors are doing business as simply due to lost jobs and creating their own jobs for themselves and seeing the opportunity to, once they get themselves going, trying to add on additional jobs for other people, which is a win-win um, for everybody. Um, in many ways, some of this, like having our small business consulting is an extension of some of the social services that are happening because we are trying to also create more jobs and employment for our um, people in Amherst. Um, we um, continue to work with a lot of clients that we worked with through the COVID grant program that we help facilitate for Amherst. Um, so we are hoping that we can continue our work that we're doing now through the CDBG program 
um, and offering, continuing to offer more services. Um, we are seeing also an increase in refugee and immigrant individuals who are those who are refugees and immigrants that are looking to open businesses, um, which is very exciting. And a lot of them are actually coming to us through places like Center for New Americans, um, the International Language Institute, those that are offering um, uh, English classes. So we're just, again, that's where like kind of the extension happens here from social services to non. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an update on where things have been in, since the beginning of this year. And um, we hope that you guys will consider this as a priority to try and keep creating more jobs where people can um, continue to live affordably in the Amherst area. So thanks again for your time. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Sarah? So I wanted to just clarify one thing, Sarah, did you say 70 businesses registered in the, since last July? No, since January of this year. Since January, wow. January through July. January. So when we talk okay. about businesses that have registered with the town, you're actually not required as an LLC or an S Corp. You are only required if you are doing one of those entities doing business as or a sole proprietor. So that does not even include the number of businesses that have started as LLCs or S Corps. So there's a significant, there's more than that. Um, but this is a single data point that the city tracks currently. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so if there's anyone else who'd like to make comments about the non-social services, uh, different priorities for the town, which can include um, micro-enterprise assistance, uh, infrastructure, sidewalks, affordable housing development, uh, things of that like, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, being none, uh, Becky, is it okay if we move on to the move on to target areas? Yeah, the okay. target areas. Um, so we had we heard one comment about this earlier, but the target areas are um, areas where the town or where the where where the advisory committee will um, kind of hear uh, proposals for those specific areas. The the state uh, DHCD re uh, requires the town to focus block grant activities into these target areas. We have, we're allowed a maximum of three. Um, so right now the target areas, I can show them on my map um, in the screen here. The current target areas, these are from 2021 um, and include uh, in red, we see kind of an area around downtown Amherst in orange, this is the East Amherst area around like Cumberland Farms and Fort River, um, going down to Colonial Village over here. And then in this pink purple color, we see uh, the Pomeroy Village Center uh, with the um, community along East Abbey Road, the Hickory Ridge uh, area, Orchard Valley neighborhood. Um, so this is where, unless anything changes as of now, we'll kind of focus our non-social service activities um, in these areas. I, I had a quick question about that. Um, but the yeah. green areas are where CGBG funds can be spent, right? Yeah, yeah, so the, and- uh, so We're yeah, targeting the areas that you're mentioning, but, but you can spend money in the other green areas, right? Um, I th they would need to be in incorporated into a target area. Okay, so you, you so we're only allowed to consider projects in the target areas, even though yeah. the other so areas the, are eligible. Yeah, and the target areas need, need to be composed of um, some, uh, these green areas, which are the eligible block groups, yeah. So it has to be an overlap of the green area and the target area? Yeah, yeah. But we can change the target area as long as it overlaps with the green area. Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 So the target areas can change. The, the what you see in green is from the census. Uh, so that can't really change. That um, 
there's a, an ineligibility for those uh, census blocks. So, like for example, we couldn't just say, oh, let's do like Bay Road area down here because none of that is income eligible. It so it's either come. it's either in the target area or a green area, but the but we're as a group we're sort of limited by the town to the target areas. We're limited by the grant requirements to the green areas, but we could if a my understanding, Ben correct me if I'm wrong, is that if but if it's in like an area that isn't green but it's in the red area, then you could you could still fund it. Correct. Yeah. So um like yeah. So if it's in if it's in the target area, that that's fine. So you know this area, I don't know, what is that near UMass? I guess that that would still be eligible um, because it's in the target area, even though it's not in, in the income those eligible. Are, and those are assigned by the town. We don't actually redraw those, right? Um, well, so the the advisory committee can make recommendations on changing right, the but, target. But then the town area. says, okay, yeah. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. I was like I looked up this map when the woman was talking about North Amherst, and I saw down at the bottom that the, all the green areas were eligible. So I had I was just like, oh, that's yeah. So um, North Amherst could become a target area if we right. um, kind of encompass uh, these areas of, of green here. Yeah. Like that, so. cool. Okay, I'm um, seeing no comments about the target areas. Um, I'll move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is a focus on the community development strategy. And I think Becky alluded to this earlier, the community development strategy is something that the town has to develop roughly every three years uh, for our um, inclusion in the community development block grant program uh, from the state. And the purpose of the community development strategy is just to basically synthesize a few things. It synthesizes all of the comments that we've heard over the past probably three years in terms of what are the social service and non-social service priorities. And then it also synthesizes um, many or almost all of the existing plans that exist out there. So, you know, we, the town produces a number of plans whether it's our master plan, uh, housing production plan, sustainability plan, um, you know, efforts for racial justice and, and, and equity, um, transportation plan. So basically the community development strategy is a synthesis of all, all the input we've heard and is a, a, a guiding document for the town and the advisory committee to help um, basically provide some um, Evidence, if you will, or or support for various for various initiatives that, that come in. So, um, functionally, the any uh, activity that's recommended uh, for funding by the by the advisory committee needs to be supported by the uh, community development strategy. So, I've I worked on it the past few months and have uh, you know tried to incorporate everything we've heard and, and different projects that have been funded over the years, just um, anticipating kind of some similar projects going forward, but also keeping it flexible to allow for new and innovative projects that might come forward as well. So um, it's been on the town's website for um, some time now uh, on the CDBG website. Um, I'll, I'll share it on my screen now. It, it, obviously a bit wordy so I'm not going to read it all right now but um, I would encourage uh, everyone um, if you're interested uh, it's on, again it's on the town's website you can um, email me with any comments you might have or if anyone has had a chance to read it feel free to raise your hand now to, to provide some comments but essentially it goes through and uh, provides an introduction about how the block grant process is administered, you know, recognizing that the town does have a CDBG advisory committee, which uh, many towns do not, I will, I will share. So we um, are allowing for, you know, community engagement through, through just having an advisory committee. 
Um, it then goes through the need for housing, documenting uh, what we've, uh, you know, how we've how we have accomplished housing goals and, and what remains to be done. Um, talks about community services, which uh, is really just the social, you know, mostly just the social social services, and you know, talks about um, you know maintaining a balanced approach amongst these different goals, which is a number of the types of projects that we've uh, funded over the past um, decades, really since the program started. Um, land use, um, economic development, you know, cultural and natural resources, open space and recreation. Um, you know, a block grant can help. You know, for example, we uh, the committee funded um, trails and, and it's better accessibility at the Hickory Ridge uh, Golf Course last year, which is a project that's underway. So it can support open space and recreation access in low and moderate income areas, um, reliable public transportation, uh, sustainability, I uh, work on summarizing the climate action adaptation and resiliency plan, um, to talk about the number of different goals that are included in there. Um, and then finally, the town's efforts uh, to increase diversity, equity, equity and inclusion across the board. Um, and our different goals in that area outlined by the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and our efforts uh, with the CRESS program as well and the new DEI department. Um, here we talk about the target areas. And then lastly, uh, one thing that's required as part of the community development strategy is to create a matrix that uh, outlines different activities that um, the town would, or that the, the the town would look to support in the next, you know, one to three to one to five years, um, and then talk about what are the different funding sources for that uh, activity. So I um, kind of went through and did the different um, categories here, and then uh, different projects or activities that would fall under that as well. So um, I encourage folks to look at that more closely if you have time and um, to provide any comments that you might have at the end. And one, one question, uh, one, one comment, one question. What comment is like, this is really, really well done. Um, this looks like a lot of work that you put in. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different stuff going on here. I was really impressed how you synthesized all these different areas of the town is working on and, and focused on. Uh, my question is the matrix at the end. Yes. Um, the priority ranking, where where does that come from and what does that mean? The ranking one through eight. Um, so that, that's been developed um, over the past few years, I would say. I think it, it stems from, um, you know, as high as the, you know, like the town council and town manager's office, kind of what are their priorities? Um, that they are really what it, one thing it comes from is the town council's priorities for the town manager, um, which then kind of circulates its way its way through every level of the town. Um, so certainly housing and, and social services are top of the list um, for the some of the town's goals. Um, but other than that, I think um, I said these are you know I I would say they're all kind of high priority. Um, one thing that I, I was asked to put a time frame on here that was a little bit more specific than just ongoing, because you know, for it's hard to say some of these things are oh, like these are you know, here. I said it's a three to five year goal, I guess, but for the most part, I think these are all kind of ongoing and high priority projects, um, and it was it was pretty hard to provide a, a ranking to to them. Um, so I don't. I don't want anyone to confuse these with the kind of um, priorities that the advisory committee is, is putting together, because um, these are more just uh, um, specific projects that might come in. For example, you know, creating affordable care housing options, you know, supporting the social service programs, um, whereas the priorities that 
we're going to uh, heard about tonight are more specific to just the social services, for example, like you know, supporting food and access, uh, affordable housing, um, food stabilization, that 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 kind of stuff. So, um, I would say, yeah, the rankings kind of stem from the town council's goals, but also just um, what we've heard over the past, you know, decade of of block grant um, hearings and, and that kind of stuff. Thanks. I had a question too. Okay. Um, under your funding sources, I notice some of the ones at the bottom, natural and cultural resources, open, open spaces, economic development, the last economic, we've got two economic bullets. Yeah. I see one is more specific to, I guess, the colleges and one is small businesses. And you don't have CDBG on the bottom three. Does that mean those are ineligible or they just haven't had it in the past? Or what, what does that mean? Um, yeah, I would say that would indicate that they're generally not eligible for okay. block grant, um, but it's okay. still, they are still kind of what we would consider community development act activities, if that makes sense. It is a little confusing, but um, yeah, so like preserving scenic and historic landmarks is not necessarily a block grant activity. Um, you know, I guess like the trail and, one, yeah. we did do yeah. some trails. That's why I was right. a little confused. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I may have ran out of room there and just um, CDB, <laughs> okay. CDBG into state and federal yeah. grants. Um, okay. And then, yeah, certainly this economic development goal with the colleges is not necessarily block grant eligible, but. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, but good clarification. Thank you. Uh, so Ben, just on a practical matter, I see we're having conversations amongst ourselves and asking questions ourselves. Um, I'm wondering if we determine that there are no further comments from the public, do we transition from a public hearing into a meeting? Yeah, so um, to, I, I do agree. I think um, public hearing is wrapping up. So we could just ask for any last comments from the uh, any members of the public in attendance um, and then move into the public meeting portion where there uh, won't be necessarily any, any public comment. Um, it'll just be more of a discussion amongst the commission members. So feel free to raise your hand if there's anybody else who wants to speak. And otherwise we will still look exactly like what we're doing exactly right now, but it'll be called yeah. something different. <laughs> okay. So I think you can uh, so call we'll, the close the, the, close the public there. hearing and yeah. um, I don't know if it matters, but it's 804 and yeah. um, move into the public meeting. Um, I see that Sarah is still in our still a panelist. I don't know if it oh, yeah, I think. matters, but um, Great, so um, I can pull up the agenda. Yeah, I think the first item is announcements. Yes. Um, I don't think I have any announcements. Unless anyone else has anything else they'd like to share. Mm -hmm. nope. <laughs> All right. Um, so why don't we discuss and review comments from public hearing and just, I guess, to sort of remind everybody where we're headed with coming out of the public hearing and then our next step is to finalize the RFP, um, which we hope to send out and the, our timeline is to send it out in, in very early October. Is that right, Ben? Um, I believe September 30th. So. September 30th, okay. So um, the idea then is that um, between now and really end of September, um, we will finalize what the priorities are on there, whether there's anything new we want to add, whether there's anything we want to take off of it. Um, and that would be guided by um, obviously the comments that we heard tonight. It can be guided by the survey that we sent out, um, any other thoughts people have. And 
one of the things that we can also talk about is whether what we want to do is um, go sort of deep into the RFP tonight, or what we want to do is talk sort of more generally and then have another meeting between now and maybe like September, whatever works for Ben, so September 26th or 7th or something, and, and finalize the RFP that would then go out on September 30th. Um, and I guess what I would, um, my recommendation, or I guess what I, one, one thought would be that we would just sort of talk more generally tonight and then maybe between, you know, in the next brief period, Ben could send out the RFP as it looks right now and we can all just put our thoughts in and maybe send them to Ben who can create a master version of everybody's comments that we could then review at the next public meeting. Does that make sense? And is that all open meeting law? Yeah, I think that sounds good. I'm fine with that. Would, you, would that include public comment or is that just us? I think that is just a, just us um, because we'll just be going over, we'll be using- uh, what People can tonight. hear what we're saying, yeah. I, so I think that, is that right, Ben? Sorry, I was a little bit distracted just taking the- Sorry, it's whether, so. Lucas was asking whether when we meet to finalize the RFP, whether that's a, a hearing or a meeting. And I was saying, I think it's a meeting because yeah. the, hearing, yeah. the hearing is tonight. Yeah, yeah, that would be a public meeting. Um, as always, they're, they're open to the public so anyone can attend. Um, and it's up to the chair's discretion whether to take public comment for this. Okay. So Ben, if you want to um, propose a date by which you would need everybody's comments if we want to work backwards when you would when I guess what what date would be the uh, most manageable for you for us to have the public meeting at which we finalize the RFP and then we could do work dates backwards. Um, yeah, so what is that I said I would. And then we can go into discussing what we just listened to at the public comment. Yeah. Um, I think if we if I had the week of September you know, 26th to, to put everything together so that I would have like five days to finalize it and put it out on the Friday, September 30th, that would be fine. Um, okay. So if we wanted to meet maybe the week of the, of the 19th. 19th like that, yeah. um, how does, does Wednesday the 21st work for people or any other night that week? That works for me. That works for me. Yeah, I think that's good. Greg, is that good for you? Yeah, that'll work for me. Okay, great. So why don't we plan then on that Wednesday the 21st for the public meeting. And then, um, so continuing to work backwards, then if what we want to review at that meeting is um, or the comments that we have on the RFP, um, then is it help, would it be more of a pain for us to send all of our individual thoughts to you and you put them all into one document for us to review? I think that's fine. There's only, only six in there. Okay. Um, so then do you, if we got that to you so that you could give it to us to review, if we got our comments to you by like the 14th or 15th, and then you would have... Yeah, yeah, I think that's the way. Yep. Okay. So why don't we do the 14th? We get our comments to you. And when are we receiving it? We're working backwards. We're we getting to that. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say because <laughs> yeah. So then maybe we could get them from you. I mean, any you probably it's probably you just you could just send us last year's in the next couple yeah, of days. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take last year's and then I'll, I'll at the very least update the dates. Um and anything else about the, because it's a two year grant, so it might look a little bit different at yeah. all. Has the state and the state has finalized the dates? Yeah, so the grant, um, yeah, so the, all the dates are now finalized. Um, okay. The grant is due to the state on March 3rd. Um, and kind of working backwards from there, you know, it takes, once all the applications have come in, it, it, can, even, it can take a month or two to even just for staff to put it all together and, and, and everything. And 
And the state's also asking that we have a list of all the activities that we're going to fund in December. Um, it seems a little ridiculous because it's like we might as well just submit the application then, but the due date's not until March. Um, so we're kind of that's that was one checkpoint I, I made sure to include in the uh, timeline where basically we have the applications due. Um, um, and I, need to get my I think it's in early November, and then there's a chance for web, web comments and all that, and so we'll have a better sense of what the activities will be in December. And we're doing two okay. years, and there's only five that we can fund, right? Social yep, services. Yep. yep, we're still unfortunately limited to the five social services and three non-social services. Um, it's, it's twice as much money as it's a two-year grant. So, um, the town will be receiving 1.65 million instead of 825,000. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So then in the, in the draft that you send around, you know, you'll already incorporate these kind of two year aspect yeah. of it. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So with uh, building costs up like they are, you're basically getting one year of uh, brick and mortar funding. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, although I will say the, um, what was it, the, the Mill Lane project, that was the continuation of the multi-use path, that actually came in under budget for once. I don't know, maybe they, I think it was a very, uh, you know, they padded the budget to make sure it was it would come in even with inflation, and they, they, they did that, or I guess Nate, my predecessor, did that successfully. So. Good for them. That's awesome. All right, so why don't we go, unless anybody has more thoughts on me. On that, we'll move into um, discussing and reviewing comments from the public hearing. It's going to be an even more difficult year. You know, I, I just feel like the need has gotten greater on in every way for people. Yeah. I mean, it's nice we have more money, but we still have the limits of five and three. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess I just wanted to remind, I guess because we have you know, Suzanne and Greg are new to the process. So um, the what we heard tonight was kind of the, the, the general just the you know opportunity for members of the public to share what they think are the you know priorities for the for the town to be funding. Um, we don't necessarily need to, you know limit the priorities you know it, it, we in, you know i think in previous years we've said we only want to fund projects that are x y or z um you know where but in other years it's more just you know i think i'm looking at the rfp for 2020. Oh, i think he just froze yes i was just thinking he froze right he's not <laughs> yeah. just studying the document yeah. But I think, well, one of the things, I'm not sure if this is what he was going to say, but I know that we've talked about before is that, you know, what, and I guess what some towns do is that they select sort of one area that they're going to give money to that year. And so they say, okay, this year we're only doing food and nutrition, um, you know, and then next year we're not going to do any food and nutrition. We're only going to do something else. Um, and I feel like we talk about that every now and then here, and we all decide we could never decide what that one thing would be. Um, and especially in a two-year cycle, that feels even more true, but it's certainly something that we could talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be, I can't decide if that would make it harder or, e I mean, harder yeah. or easier. I guess it moves, moves, moves the hard decision kind of maybe earlier in the process. Right. If we said we're only doing food and nutrition, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that would do to the applications, but I imagine it would, it would obviously shift them tremendously. But right. right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just feel like we've heard so much about housing and, you know, all of these needs seem so tremendous. It's hard to imagine crossing them out so early in the process. Yeah. The other thing that, I, that struck me is that. Um, even though you know we're past the pandemic and 
you know, one huh. would have thought, you know, the, the, the worst is over, but, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. And so even though we're in a two-year cycle, not a one-year cycle, I guess it's hard for me to imagine that the conditions that we're, you know, seeing now are going to improve a lot or, you know, get a lot better in two years. And so I think that, um, it, you know, that we can probably expect that it's going to continue and that the needs we see now um, will continue. So I guess in that sense, um, the two-year aspect is not going to be that difficult, right? Yeah. Well, one year's already passed, isn't it? So we're doing two years, but we're sort of retro funding, my understanding, because we didn't really do anything last year. Right? I don't know. Is that right? I thought it went, oh, Ben's back. Sorry, I'm like on my phone now. I don't know why my internet <laughs> came up. Um, we tried to guess what you were maybe talking about and thought maybe it had to do with selecting, you know, that, that we had the opportunity to either narrow or expand the kinds of um, tar priority areas. And so we were just having a discussion about um, if we were interested in doing that, I don't think anybody's yeah. interested in narrowing the, the priority areas for the grant uh, or for the in the RFP. But Lucas was just asking, and it made me think maybe I don't know um, the right answer is that it's two years, but he was saying that his understanding is that it's retroactive back because we didn't fund last year. For the last year? No. So um, the, the funding will start on July 1st of 20. A gap in funding. Yeah, um, we lost you for just your connection is not but, good. Then so the funding you said the funding will start in July first of what year? Twenty twenty three. Right. Okay. Right. So the funding is for fiscal years twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. Correct. No, twenty three, twenty four, twenty four, twenty five. If the fiscal year. Right, right. So we're, we're not going to do July this again 1, next year. Three. Right. So that's another part is sort of what we have this year now that we don't. I, I think we might want to check on this because my we did I joined in the end of 2019 and we did that funding the funding that spring. And then we didn't do anything funding last year. I I can't imagine that we're going to do funding the spring and then there's not going to be anything for two years that's correct yeah really yeah that's i mean it's double the money yeah we but that's because we missed a year it was it was delayed but um there was still funding uh that we're, we're just getting grants started from from last year okay all right Are, is the state going, or well, you maybe don't know, are they going to shift to this two-year cycle? Um, no, I think they'll shift to, to after this two-year cycle, they'll, they'll get back to one-year grants. Yeah. Um, all right, I think my internet's back, so I'm going to rejoin on my computer, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, but to, to speak to the other issue of uh, doing everything, you know, full-on one, nothing anybody else. Um, I see the CDBG committee as sort of a, a piece of a larger pie uh, of funding. And I, I think to sort of counterweight um, to, to one person and not, it, 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 it seems maybe so that other people do it in their situation, but I did, it doesn't seem like the way that this is built, the system's built to sort of piecemeal it all out. So that nobody relies on us 100%, but also, you know. Yeah, I think we're probably all, in, are we all in agreement that we're not going to want to do that? And then we can put that whole idea to the side. <laughs> yeah, yep. particularly if there's going to be any lapse, then we wouldn't want to fully fund something and then have them have a lapse in funding. Right. Right. Is Ben coming back in? <laughs> oh, there he is. 
raising his hand asking to be allowed to talk yeah <laughs> um <laughs> no, i'm on the other side of things now um <laughs> becky i think you you should be able to go to my name and and say promote the panelists Oops. There we go. Oh, it says I failed to change role to panelist. It's great. This is how I feel. I've I've been doing this for so long and I still don't have it down. <laughs> it's not letting me. Oh man. Okay. I mean it oh. gives me the option, but then when I try it says failed to change role to panelist. Okay. I'm not sure what that's about. Um well, we have you it, here, sort of. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, uh, I, I, before the meeting started, I made you a co-host, Becky. Yeah, no, thinking. no, it gives it gives me the option, but then when I click on promote to panelist, oh, wait, maybe it's letting me do it now. No, then I get a, uh, a error message. Okay. Well, let me. I'll try logging back into the group. Um. um. All right, well, we'll, in terms of, um, just so we hit all the ag agenda. Yeah. Next is, um, unless anybody has any other comments from the public hearing. Um, discussing the review criteria. So this is um, the, what we look at to review in the RFP. And I think it might be an area that we wanna sort of table this discussion for after we really, um, look at the RFP on our own and, and determine. I know last year we made a couple of additions to the things that we, areas that we would look at for review. Um, but unless anybody wants to talk about that now, we might just hold off on that conversation. I guess I just have a question. So as part of the RFP that we'll be looking at and reviewing, does that identify this strategy and these priorities, like these eight priorities is that's part of that process? Okay, thank you. Yes, so it has the priority areas like housing, yeah. um, you know, case management, and then there are the criteria that we look at to review. Yes. And then there it would be about, you know, breadth of service or um, I'm blanking on what they are. But it's like high, high functioning board and right. um, okay. financial, you know, capability and that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then the next item is to discuss target areas. Um, and so one thing that, that Ben had mentioned to me yesterday when we were talking um, was that we, and Ben obviously correct me if I misunderstood this, but is that we can sort of reassess what our target areas could would be based on the, applications we get for different projects in the town. And so we don't necessarily have to select those up front. I mean, that we're limited in town to what the target areas are um, in terms of like those green areas, but we don't have to necessarily eliminate any up front. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. But that, but if, <coughs> excuse me, to Hilda's point, if we don't add them we wouldn't get applications for those areas would we i mean if they, if people feel like they have to be in the target area to apply it feels like that yeah well it's kind backwards. of a you know chicken or egg kind of thing because um the truth of it is that you know i guess it's really the the, the town is the one that's in the position to uh, propose most of these non-social service projects. I mean, the we we were careful to you know make sure that many of the Amherst Housing Authority complexes are within these target areas. So I, I don't know. I can't think of one in North Amherst per se. Um, so like you know, we want to make sure that many of the Amherst Housing Authority um, neighborhoods are included in these target areas so that they can you know freely you know proposed projects based on, you know, just their need and, and not necessarily be confined to one of these target areas. Um, 
And then, you know, Valley CDC does these, you know, the micro enterprise assistance. That's not, doesn't really have a physical impact on the land. So it's not really, it doesn't adhere to the same target areas. But, um, you know, I think if, you know, speaking of, as a town staff person now, like as, if we hear from the public a big demand for projects in North Amherst, then we can then say, oh, what well, North Amherst isn't a target area now, but it sounds like it should be because we want to do this sidewalk project there or a parklet project up there. So um, it kind of depends on what we're hearing and kind of what, you know, working with our DBW to figure out where are the biggest needs in town as well. And, and you know, we can move things around from there. Okay, thank you. So with that said, um, it might make sense not to necessarily limit the target areas now and to wait and see what comes in. Yep. Everyone agrees? Okay. Um, and now we move to public comment, um, I guess on just more general areas, Ben, that just wouldn't have been part of the hearing. Yeah. Yeah, just if there's any other um, additional comments. Yeah. Uh, from, from... So if anybody who's here wants to make a comment, feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring you in. I don't see anyone. And are there any items not anticipated within the last 48 hours? Um, no, I guess just uh, for the next meeting date. Um, so we'll, it sounds like it, it will be needed. Just it can be a probably a brief meeting to, to finalize the RFP um, at the end of September. And then I'll um, send out, as soon as I have it ready, like the a draft of the RFP. And I think, you know, it'll, I think the, area of interest will be kind of what we're saying are the are the priorities um so there's that just that paragraph on the second page so I'll, I'll keep that i won't change that much from from 2021 and then kind of have folks focus on that for mm -hmm. for discussion later in the month so ben do you think you can get those to us by september 7th and then we'll get them back to you by september 14th and then we'll have our meeting on september 21st yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah, okay. sounds good. Yeah. Great. All right, terrific. Um, well, if anybody has any other comments, speak now. All right, then. Um, do I have to do anything in particular to close out the meeting, Ben? Can I just say good night? Yeah. Um, it's eight twenty nine. I think mo you can entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second. Okay. With that, then we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Nice job, Becky. Nice, nice job, Becky. Nice, Becky. <laughs> well done. Bye. 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 Bye.